So one of the problems people find, manufacturers find when using plant proteins is A, there is such a variety of potential ingredients um, in the first place. There are all different types of legumes, even other um, either other uh, things, potatoes, any plants have a certain amount of protein in them and can be and that protein can be extracted. Now it's quite often it's the materials with high protein to begin with, soy, uh, peas, lentils, that this can, you know, the yield is much higher. So this is why these are some of the more common proteins found on the market. But potato protein is also one. There's lots of proteins available, but it's not just the type of protein which is important. It's the, um, the, the way it's been extracted, the harvest date, the harvest area, the, the origin. Um, there is not just one type of chickpea protein. There are hundreds, if not more, types of chickpea protein available on the market. And what I'm presenting here today is a solution to uh, to that variability. If you understand what parameters are important for a, a protein uh, material for your product and process, then you can identify these much easier by doing these simple tests. <clears throat> um, plant protein, very similar to egg, is highly functional. However, unlike egg, it doesn't, not all plant proteins do all of these, um, function, can provide the all of these functionalities in one ingredient like egg can. Stabilization of air, so foaming. Uh, common examples include aquafaba is a very common one. Um, used to make meringues, used in baking products, used even, even in things like cocktails to make the white foam that you would get with egg white on the top. Emulsion, emulsions and emulsification, plant proteins can be used to make sauces, mayonnaises, etc. And gelling, plant proteins are often used or, or are being selected to be used in meat analogues. So things that are trying to be trying to replicate meat, burgers, sausages. Uh, and quite often they want the, the same sort of properties as meat. They want it to set uh, and have a certain texture once it's cooked. Um, so uh, they want to bind all the ingredients that they mix together together. Um, so, so, so the same Functional properties are important when selecting plant protein as it is when when using egg. And of course, plant proteins are used to replace egg in lots of applications. So if you're replacing egg in a certain application, it's not the ingredient you need to replace. It's the functionality that that ingredient is providing that you need to replace. For example, if you are making a mayonnaise, it may just be the emulsification that you need to replace. And you may not necessarily need to own, to re, uh, well, you very much likely uh, need or want to replace um, egg with, with more than one ingredient and potentially a protein or uh, other types of ingredients such as hydrocolloids, for example. Proteins um, on the market can come in lots of different types. You can get concentrates and isolates. These vary in the concentration of actual protein in, in the material. Concentrates being around 50, 60 percent uh, protein, 70, 80 percent upwards are, are, are often called isolates. Um, it's important to know the protein content, but it's also important to know what is the other 50, 40, 30, 20 percent of that powder material that you have and how can that affect functionality? 
quite often um, certain whole food flours, lentil flour, bean flours can be uh, concentrates or, or high protein versions of these can be created by a process called air classification where it separates the starch and the protein on density and particle size. But what that means is you are left with a significant amount of starch uh, potentially left over. Now, starch obviously has its own functional properties, so it's really important to understand the functional properties of the ingredient you are choosing. If you if it contains carbohydrate, if it contains starch, you want to understand how does that starch affect your product and process? Is it required? Is the gelling useful? It may be, uh, but it, but when comparing different proteins for for whatever reason or getting different batches, if that starch gelatinization from the the thirty percent that's not protein is vital. Are you keeping a track on that and its its viscosity modifying ability? Uh, I mentioned before the functionality is influenced by the the type of extraction the protein has gone through. If there is a thermal step or a heating step in the protein extraction, then this can have an effect on the functionality as well. Denaturing the proteins can can uh, have an effect on the functionality. The protein type, the protein sizes. So if you're extracting maybe soluble proteins, these may be a certain type or size. Some of the insoluble proteins may be different sizes. What proteins are you using? What proteins do you want to use and why? These are the questions you need to be asking yourself. And as I mentioned before, it's not just um, proteins that can be used to provide functionality in meat analogues, bakery application. Quite often proteins are combined with other ingredients such as starches, other hydrocolloids such as gums, heat, other things. Methacell is a common one. Um, uh, and it's important to know how these, in these interact with each other. And it's not just necessarily the protein functionality you need to keep an eye on. When you get information on a, on a specification uh, for these plant proteins, they very rarely have information about its emulsification capability. Sometimes it may have its foaming ability, but it, it um, very rarely has information about its gelling capability either. However, these are the most important things for you to consider when using plant proteins, because these are the things that have an effect on your process and your product. So what we're what I am proposing here is a way of having more transparency, more oversight of your ingredients. The example I gave in the last um, presentation is of wheat flour. Now gluten or, or the gluten forming proteins have a very specific protein functionality. The function of gluten, gluten is to provide elasticity um, uh, in bread products. So bread manufacturers, when buying wheat flour, have very specific tests that relate to their process that give them an indication of the quality of that ingredient. Things like extensibility, dough development, water absorption. These are specific tests for uh, wheat flour that are requested by the manufacturers at the supplier from the suppliers or the millers in that case. All I'm saying here is maybe we need to be considering this for more ingredients than just wheat flour. There are tests that we can do to analyse the functional properties and give us more oversight and control over the ingredients for plant proteins. One thing I will touch on briefly at the end as well is te TVP, textured vegetable protein. Now this is not necessarily um, going to be um, related to the next few functional properties that are coming up. But there are tests you can do on textured vegetable protein, TVP, to analyse 
it's quality for your specific process. Hydration properties, it, how its structure and chain, texture changes with water, temperature and time, for example. This is a slide that I think is useful for understanding why it's important to do the, these types of analysis. If you understand the ingredient functional properties, and if you can then relate these properties to how they affect your process and product, you can then identify which of those functional properties are most important and which ones are the best ones for predicting quality. You can then do the tests required on those identified functional properties, which allow you to monitor your ingredients with more control. You can say, we want to know what its gelling capability is every time we get a new batch. We can see how its foaming ability or its surface tension changes from batch to batch. This gives you the options of looking for new ingredients without having to buy tons of, uh, of material if you're able to get samples and you're able to test these materials functional properties you can see do they line up with what we require. You can create your own specifications effectively with the tests that are most important to your product and process and eventually this the, the main objective for many um, manufacturers this year is save money and reduce waste. And this is exactly what this intends to help with. If you know what your ingredients do and you know how they're changing with time and batches, you're able to have more control uh, over your, your um, processes. Quite often things go wrong on plant um, and it's unknown why something has gone wrong and it's put down to just that's just the way it is. With more information, um, what's the phrase? Uh, knowledge equals power. So, moving on to some functional properties that are really important to consider for plant proteins, um, especially if you're trying to identify either, yeah, if you're trying to pick a specific. Um, material to go into a process. If you're looking at, say, 10 different chickpea proteins, one of the quickest tests you can do is to look at how these uh, proteins interact with water. Now, this is one of the key things that I don't think people pick up. You can measure protein uh, solubility and we can measure protein solubility here at Camden. But what is not even one thing that is necessarily indicated on a specification, whether the material is soluble or not. Now, the quick test for this is mix the powder with water. Is Does it go clear? Even if it's coloured, but it is clear, you can see the light through it, then it is more soluble. If it goes cloudy, then you certainly have a lot of insoluble material in there. <clears throat> How much insoluble, how much soluble material, that also can be worked out. Do you just want soluble protein? Is that useful for your product? Uh, these are the questions to ask yourself. Remember that they contain other components that may not be soluble or have, may also be soluble, but have an impact uh, on when you mix them with water. If they have starch in, they may thicken uh, and change properties when heated. The solubility for proteins is a function of its of pH and ionic strength. So changing the acidity of the um, solution that a protein is in will have an effect on whether it is soluble or not. Um, we can use this to identify what is known as the isoelectric point. So proteins are proteins are um, charged uh, by their nature, uh, but at a certain pH, those charges become neutral, known as the isoelectric point. And when those charges are neutral, they no longer repel 
because they no longer have the same charge uh, and they can then what's called flocculate stick together and come out of solution <coughs> excuse me when thinking about solubility of proteins there are different ways to assess the solubility you can simply mix the material uh, with water centrifuge it to bring the insoluble material to the bottom measure the solids and water ratio of the pellet that you get and the solids to water ratio you get of the um, supernatant the liquid and that can give you a simple solubility measurement what that doesn't do is tell you how much protein is in the it has been solubilized there may be carbohydrate that is soluble in there as well so if it's specifically the protein solubility that you're after a more specific test is required <clears throat> if also when mixing protein uh, with water how um, much it if it is not soluble or even if it is but particularly if it's not soluble the effect on viscosity is important. Lots of protein materials suck up lo lots of water many times their own weight. Uh, and this is known as its water holding capacity. Knowing the water holding capacity of a protein is really important for your process. If you're changing ingredient or your ingredient is changing in water holding capacity, this will affect, um, for example, if you're using a cake batter and you had something that is sucking up more water has more water holding capacity you may have a much uh, thicker batter may even be solid and be unable to be processed in the normal way you may need to adjust things like water level um, so it's it's really key uh, to understand the effect of water holding capacity and viscosity of, of your of your protein material sometimes this water holding capacity can be affected by denaturation. So it may be sucking up a lot of water and providing lots of viscosity, but when heated up, the denaturation means it no longer holds that viscosity. Uh, and is that consistent amongst all your protein materials, uh, amongst all your batches? These are the questions you need to ask yourself. Measuring viscosity, there's lots of simple ways this can be done um, on. Uh, in the factory or, uh, or in the lab. Bostwick analysis is a simple trapdoor analysis. Flow cup is a very, very common one. Viscometers and rheometers are more accurate uh, and that's what we use here at, at Camden BRI to analyse the, the viscosities very accurately with good temperature control. <clears throat> Aeration and foaming is another important property for plant proteins. You may be making a foam specifically, either whipping up a foam for say a meringue or incorporating air into a batter. The stabilization of that air is really important. I've got a little diagram here just to explain a little bit about the mechanism. Um, of how this works. You have a water and air and there's an interface between them. In the water, the water molecules can um, interact with water molecules uh, all around them. They can, in the bulk of the water, they can pull and push with the water molecules all around them. However, at the surface, they are unable to interact with anything above them. So there is a more stronger interaction with those either side of them. And that's what gives surface tension. That's why when you see pond skippers on, on ponds, they're able to stand on the top. If, you're, if you then add a surface active material, such as a protein, um, as shown here by the squiggly line, a globular protein that would be described as with a chain of amino acids, wrapped up into its tertiary structure. Um, when this comes to the surface, if it's a surface active protein, it unravels on the surface. Um, rem 
dislodging, um, taking the place of some of the water molecules and reducing the surface tension. It's very difficult to create bubbles, create surfaces uh, in just plain water. But if you were to add a surface active material, such as washing up liquid, it's much easier to make bubbles. And when we say bubbles, what we really mean is we're making surfaces. And there's lots of ways we can analyze this aeration uh, capability. There's could be the simple way of using a benchtop mixing um, machine to whisk it up and pour it into a measuring cylinder. Measuring the foam expansion um, can tell you how much foam it's making and also monitoring how that foam and that liquid drains over time can give you information about the stability. If you have a very stiff foam like the red lentil foam showed on the right hand side, you can still measure foam expansion just in a different way by measuring the weight of a known volume uh, of um, the foam and then measuring the same, uh, measuring the density of the starting aqueous solution. We can also do the fundamental measurements that are key for measure for for producing foam foaming capabilities. Surface tension can be measured directly. We have um, a piece of equipment called a drop shape analyzer, which analyze takes a droplet of an aqueous solution, measure, measures the shape of that pendant droplet, and can provide a measurement of the surface tension. Lower surface tension often indicates better foaming capability. Um, there are a few um, there are a few um, exceptions in some milks, for example, free fatty acids can lower surface tension at the same time as destabilizing foams. Um, so again, that relates how do these measurements relate to your specific product? Viscosity is also really important when analyzing uh, foaming capability. This is known as the kinetic barrier to foam collapse. So a more viscous solution, if the liquid surrounding the bubbles is more viscous, it's more thick, then it will drain away slower. So it is a kinetic barrier rather than a thermodynamic barrier as the surface tension is. And one piece of equipment that we have very recently had accepted by our CAPEX team and we're hoping to get in within the next couple of weeks is a dynamic foam analyzer. Uh, this is a scientific way of analyzing the foaming capabilities that doesn't require the sort of crude method of benchtop whisks, which can be very useful but can have its uh, difficulties with um, um, consistency as well. Emulsification when, is when the oil droplets are stabilized in an aqueous solution. Um, the, the interfacial properties can be measured by the drop shape analyzer. As mentioned before, instead of having a single droplet, you could have a, a an oil droplet, um, a water droplet inside an oil droplet. You may have heard of things called something called the uh, hydrophilic lipophilic balance, the HLB. This is uh, when a measurement of emulsi emulsifiers that is done on the um, done on the hydrophobic and hydrophilic parts of that molecule and can be calculated theoretically of how much it likes being in the oil and how much it likes being in the water. But here at Camden, when we're asked to help with emulsion capability, uh, we can make up model emulsions. So a specific ratio of aqueous solution of the plant protein and the oil uh, can be made up to induce a certain amount of instability. We want them to separate over time. We usually have around a week uh, 
um, because we want to measure the rate at which they separate and that gives us an indication of the stability properties. We can also measure the physical properties of the emulsion themselves. Particle size is really important for emulsions. The dis <coughs> distribution of sizes can indicate emulsion stability. Smaller bubble, smaller oil droplets, sorry, can indicate better emulsion stability. We can the viscosity of the emulsion themselves can indicate how stable it's going to be. So just a little diagram of the little globular proteins occupying the interfaces between oil droplets. So protein gelling with a uh, specific relation to plant proteins can be a very tricky one. It's not always obvious whether a protein has gelling capabilities or not. Sometimes a specific concentration is re required to produce a gelling uh, effect uh, known as its critical gelling concentration. Um, plant protein and gelling can be quite tricky. You may not know whether your protein gels or not. It may not be information on the specification or not. Um, uh, it's also one of the rarer functional properties. There are lots of plant protein materials on the market and a, a small proportion of these provide, provide gelling capabilities. Um, so they can be hard to find. And some things like potato protein um, can have uh, gelling capabilities. But on this slide, I've shown, shown you a few different anal analytical techniques that can be done to identify the gelling properties of a plant protein. Differential scanning calorimetry, DSC, is a thermal technique used to analyze the temperature um, at which a thermal transition occurs, such as protein denaturation. And we're not just talking about protein denaturation here, we're talking about protein de denaturation, which leads to coagulation. So the proteins unravel when they're denatured, exposing the internal functional um, amino acids, which are able to link to other protein molecules and create a gel network. Lots of proteins denature, but not all proteins denature and then coagulate. Um, so there are examples here of some proteins denaturing uh, in the DSC is giving temperature range. I think um, there some of these are compared to egg. I won't go into too deep, too much details about the specific samples. These are just showing you what the, the traces look like. Differential scanning calorimetry can show you what temperature the proteins denature at and also how energetic was that transition, how much energy was required to denature them. Useful information um, uh, if for things like baking or any process which has a, a heating step. <clears throat> Rapid viscoanalysis or RVA can show um, is is no is a viscosity analysis where you're measuring viscosity of a liquid and heating it at the same time as continuing to measure that viscosity. Um, this is a useful technique for analysing um, flour and starch gelation, but we've been using it more and more to measure protein gelation and protein coagulation. One of the downsides to using RVA is you can only measure viscosity of liquids, so you have to be using um, low concentrations um, because if you're making a gel network, maybe a weak gel, then um, the stirring motion will break this gel network. If you are worried about the impact of stirring, we can use rheological techniques uh, using a rheometer, an example in the bottom left, which instead of doing a stirring motion for the gel while heating it, can do very small oscillations back and forth and, and can measure how its viscoelastic properties, so how liquid, how solid is it, how that changes with, with temperature. <clears throat> 
uh, and can give us an indication. So we got two uh, plant proteins and how they set differs um, depending on on the type of protein. The storage modulus is elastic modulus. How solid is it? And there's another technique that is quite common. Um, however, from my experience doing analysis of proteins and other gelling techniques, not always as useful as uh, uh, people think it may be. Um, this is a technique based on a gelatin bloom test where you take a sample, you gel it, so you take your plant protein solution, you heat it in a water bath for a certain amount of time, you then let it cool and then you measure the gel strength by using a texture analyzer to compress or penetrate into the surface of the gel. Now there are lots of issues practically with this. How long do you cook it for? What temperature? Um, how long do you cool it for? What's the temperature control on the cooling? Um, you know, type of probe and things are obviously key as well. We can do this test, but we have found it to be of limited use um, when trying to identify uh, how it relates to a process quite often because What's important in a process is how it's gelling li live during the baking. How does its property change during um, a heating step um, rather than how does it how hard does it set um, after it's been cooked and cooled? And, and that's one of the key things to take away from these webinars is that the functionality of your ingredients is very specific to your process and product. It's, it's very important to understand how the functional properties affect the physical properties of intermediate products such as batters. So any analysis that you can do that, that I've discussed on the um, the ingredient itself, the, the protein material, we can do the same analysis on batters, um, for example, on intermediate products. So what is the gelling properties of the batter? What is the aeration properties of the batter? What's the density, the viscosity of the batter? These are things that you can have in your arsenal of, um, of, of data so you can make good decisions of um, what when things go wrong. You have a good set of data of what your batter, what your intermediate product should be like. So often it's maybe one thing, uh, a viscosity measurement, for example, but there's lots of information that you could get about your intermediates would provide you better, uh, better information. Uh, and how these affect your final product uh, and the final properties during baking, which I'll touch on uh, in the next slide. So I mentioned earlier that I'll touch on uh, TVP, textured vegetable protein. What I've mentioned so far doesn't necessarily relate to textured vegetable protein. This is a, a, a soy based often um, material that when you uh, that has been extruded and when you mix it with water, it can create an almost um, tuna mayo like texture which when baked or cooked can give a certain fibrous structure uh, that can mimic meat uh, to, to a certain extent. Now it's important if you're looking at different textured vegetable proteins, if you're getting different batches, what properties about these um, TVPs are, are important for your product. <clears throat> its hydration properties, its particle size, how much it breaks down with time, temperature, for example. <clears throat> so an example I gave in the egg one was how this can relate to a cake baking. So I just want to go over that again in this, um, uh, uh, in this presentation. If we know the rheological properties of the protein when it sets, how it sets, at what, how strong a gel does it set, what's the rate of that gelling, 
And we also know the rheological properties of a cake batter. We can measure that uh, at Camden um, with a very sp specific technique with the rheometer, very similar to the, the protein one. But one of the issues is the air in a cake batter. Uh, it's very difficult to change, uh, measure the rheological properties of something that is expanding. So what we can do is remove the air and stop that expansion and analyze the rheological properties of the batter only. We can then relate that to how the cake bakes in an oven. So quite often when trying lots of ingredients to measure um, uh, to see if you can make a cake out of plant proteins, you put them in the oven, you get them out, you look at them and they're sunk, for example, and you immediately dismiss uh, that ingredient because it hasn't made a good cake. What we're saying is if you're able to monitor how that cake expands and collapses, at what point does it expand and collapse? You can modify your recipe, you can include ingredients to potentially set the cake at the correct time. So it's a really useful technique for monitoring how cakes rise, set, and um, it's known as the foam to sponge conversion, where the, the, the bubbles burst um, after the structure has set and you get a sponge rather than um, a foam. Another thing we can do with cake, however, this does require the hiring of a medical CT scanner, which is uh, not the cheapest thing, but can be very insightful. Is using an MRI scanner. A very it, this was an example of a um, this was a medical MRI scanner which we had in our car park. Uh, on, a, on a few occasions, we have a custom built oven and we can monitor the density during baking. It's really useful research tool that we can do here. I think the, the, you know, the key to these slides is to think how, what is it about the physical properties of my ingredient are important for my product? In this case, the cake, the batter rheology, allowing it to expand However, then setting at the correct time uh, is, is really important to prevent collapse back. Um, so doing this with different plant proteins would be would be really interesting. And I'll just put this slide up again. I think it's a really important one. So it's about knowing your ingredients, knowing how that affects your process and your products. Then you can um, identify which functional properties and therefore which tests are best predictors of quality and consistency for your process. You can then monitor batch to batch variation of these ingredients if you know which tests are important. And then when picking new ingredients, you can select the ones that fit the functionality profile uh, best. Uh, and keep selecting those ones and keep monitoring the ingredient functional properties with the main objective that many of manufacturers have in mind of saving money and reducing waste. <clears throat> and just as I did with the egg slide, it's important to be able to relate these results about how the functional properties vary with um, the biochemical and composition composition properties of the powders, the protein materials themselves. What's the protein content? What's the other composition uh, component? Sorry, starches, other carbohydrates, um, for example. What's the size of these proteins? And, what, uh, uh, and, and one thing that's key for these as well, what's the amino acid profile as well? All things that we can do here at Camden and it's just a little reminder that I've spoken to you a lot about physical properties, uh, but Camden is a is a much bigger organization than just physical characterization. We can look at everything in conjunction. We can help with product development. We can help with um, sensory evaluation. Uh, we can help with a, a, a nutritional uh, analysis. Um, we can do it all uh, in one on one site. So that's just a, 
picture of the um, SDS, SGS uh, pay, SDS page um, electrophoresis to measure the size of proteins. That's one way that we can do that here at Camden. HPLC is another. Um, and we have a whole bi biochemistry department which can provide consultancy on these sorts of things. So last slide then, uh, just to go over things, go over it one more time. Plant proteins vary greatly in their functionality. There's so many out there to choose from. It's often difficult uh, to select the right one for, for your product and process. The vari variability in these functional properties is not given on specifications or not always given. And if it is, this can be uh, specific these results can be specific to that supplier and can't be translated to another supplier's results. Um, functionality perform of the relationship of functionality to performance is product specific. So what how a protein will re relate in one cake application will be different to another cake application, which will be different to a meat analog application. So we want to help you make more informed choices. We want to help you make and maintain consistency and quality during your process through to your final product and hopefully reduce waste and save money. So thank you everyone for listening.